Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in the Discussing Race and Inequality in the Classroom series. My name is Kaz Finley, and I am the Supervisor of Education and Museum Outreach for the Federal Bank of Cleveland. I am one of over 50 subject matter experts throughout the Federal Reserve System who serves as an education outreach arm of the Fed. Our group, representing audiences within our various districts, provides professional development for pre-kindergarten through college level educators, offer ec economic literacy programs for K through 16 students, partners with like-minded organizations to promote financial capability and develops classroom ready resources to support instruction in economics, personal finance, college and career readiness, and related courses. Our collective efforts are aimed at increasing educators' ability to teach economics and personal finance while helping students and the public gain real life skills to increase their economic literacy and financial acumen. My colleagues and I are pleased you could join us for this important discussion on issues that are currently spanning the globe. The topic of racial inequality has surfaced internationally, causing many of us to think about the constructs of race very differently and more broadly. At times, it seems the racial divide has become even more pronounced, stemming from tragic real life events combined with a universal health crisis. During tonight's program, we'll examine current perspectives on racial economic opportunity. We'll also touch on economic factors that affect minority populations, offering real world material for your economic classroom. We brought national experts together to address these issues and you can interact with them. So prepare your questions. Before we begin our exploration on this topic, let me first share our disclaimer that the views and perspectives of those speaking tonight are their own and do not represent the Federal Reserve System. This evening's session will include a brief keynote presentation, a panel discussion, and open forum for your questions. Please submit questions using the Q&A button, not the chat. Now to introduce our presenters. Tonight's keynote speaker will be Tim Todd, who is an executive writer and historian with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. He is the author of seven books on the history of, bank, of, of banking and financial services, including most recently, Let Us Put Our Money Together, the founding of America's first black banks. He's also served as a writer and associate producer for a documentary about the history of the Federal Reserve that was produced by Kansas City PBS station, KCPT. Prior to joining the Federal Reserve, Tim was a journalist for 10 years and spent another five years as a writer focused on income markets. Our panel, Tim will be joined by Kristen Brody, fellow in economic studies at Brookings Institution and policy director of the Hamilton Project, as well as Ryan Dunn, Assistant Vice President of Community Development and Engagement at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. We will hear more about them at the start of the panel. Lastly this evening, panel moderator will be Mary Souter, Assistant Vice President and Economic Education Officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I'll now turn the floor over to Tim Ty for his presentation. Tim? All right, thank you, Kaz. Uh, wow, that's always shocking to see your own head uh, come up on screen like that. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, tonight to tonight's event. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about a uh, publication that we produced at the Kansas City Fed about, uh, about a year ago called Let Us Put Our Money Together. It's a story of the first black banks in the United States. And if I can uh, uh, figure out how to share my screen here, we will get started, so. Hopefully you are uh, you are seeing that. So, so when we talk about um, um, 
black banking in the United States. Black banks are uh, within what is known uh, in the industry as minority-owned depository institutions or MDIs. So you'll see a lot of research out there about uh, MDIs. And MDI is just a way of saying a bank that's largely minority-owned. So 51% uh, minority ownership under the FDIC definition. Uh, there's 142 MDIs in the United States. And so there's different types of MDIs. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in just a second. Uh, about 120 of the MDIs are what we would consider community banks. So these are small local institutions. I think a lot of times when people hear the term uh, community bank, you think of a, of a bank in a small town. And that's not necessarily the case. Community banks are in, in cities all over America, but they are smaller banks and they are engaged in, the, uh, in what we think of as sort of the basic business of banking. So that's taking in deposits and then lending out uh, those deposits back into the community to help people uh, do all the things they wanna do to improve their quality of living. So buy homes, uh, get further education, buy a car, uh, start a business, all those types of things. So, um, the history of MDIs recently, you can see from this chart. So this is all classifications of MDIs and you can see uh, this is the number of institutions. And so this has um, risen up since 2001, you saw the increase. Uh, that's the period of course, ahead of the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. And then you see a decline after that. And so to sort of go inside those numbers because a lot of people uh, and the research is changing more recently, but a lot of times sort of all MDIs are lumped together and really all MDIs are, are not the same. And so if you go and you look, and this is broken down uh, on this slide is broken down by category. You will see that that green line at the top, those are actually, uh, and these are the FDIC's categories. So they're not real, uh, maybe how we would like to break them down, but this is the way they're broken down. And so that green line represents, that's uh, Asian American, uh, institutions. And so that's a very large uh, geographic region, right? So that's basically from uh, individuals with backgrounds and, and heritage from Europe all the way across Asia, uh, Australia, Pacific Islands, places like that. So it's a very large group. Um, the reason that number is so high is there has been a significant immigration of uh, wealthy individuals from, uh, from parts of East Asia into the United States. And those individuals have used uh, some, of, in some instances, used their money to buy uh, interest and ownership of banks. And so that's uh, sort of throws the overall shape uh, that we were just looking at a second ago. That overall shape really reflects primarily uh, the Asian banks. So if you take that out, uh, then what you're, what you're left with is it paints a little clearer picture. And you can see that the number of African-American or black owned banks in the United States has been on a pretty much continual decline for the last 20 years. And even though in some of the other categories you see uh, a little bit of a bump and maybe a little bit of a decline, there's still more institutions than there were in 2001, but that's not the case with African-American institutions. And so that's uh, obviously, obviously concerning because we know that uh, these banks in general are located in minority, uh, low to moderate income communities and very important uh, to providing financial resources to those communities. So as you see that decline, uh, and then look at this chart. And so this is a, a chart from Federal Reserve data. And again, I'm not a big fan of the way even we at the Fed sometimes divide this data, but what you're looking at right now is uh, these are the percent of households that are fully banked. Okay, so they're considered fully banked in that they have uh, a savings account and they have a, a checking account at least. So if you're not fully banked, then obviously you're unbanked. So you don't have a checking account or a savings account or you're underbanked, what we consider underbanked. And so usually an underbanked household would be one where you have a checking account that you use to pay your bills, uh, but you don't have any savings and, and uh, there's a good chance you don't have a relationship with the bank where you're gonna be in a position to uh, borrow money uh, and do some of those other things with access to financial services that are so important. And so if you fall outside of that, if you are unbanked or underbanked, or even sometimes people who are, are fully banked, uh, you can become vulnerable to what we refer to as alternative financial services providers. So these are the folks uh, that you see, they're the payday lenders, title loans, check cashing services, rent to own businesses, pawn shops, all those places that charge uh, exorbitantly high interest rates. Some states regulate them better than others. Some states it's very much a, uh, just a very much sort of wild west open door environment. So they can really uh, take advantage of, uh, of consumers 
who are borrowing money and doing business with them versus the, the fee structures at a, at a traditional bank. We also know uh, if you go in and, and, you know, it's kind of interesting, you can do research on this and you can read the studies or you can, uh, in most American cities, you can just drive around and you will see that alternative financial services provi providers are disproportionately located in poor minority neighborhoods. That's definitely the case here in Kansas City, many other uh, cities that I'm familiar with, whereas these are neighborhoods in some cases that have lost banks. And we know that when a uh, low to moderate income minority neighborhood loses a bank, it is very unlikely that another bank is going to step in uh, to serve people in that neighborhood. And so you'll get these types of uh, uh, services providers begin to develop. And so these not only hurt people in terms of, uh, you know, if you have a, you know, say you have a medical emergency, a dental emergency, if you go to the dentist and pay to have some work done, uh, it can be very problematic and very uh, financially crippling to individuals. Uh, people who use these firms uh, generally have little to no uh, um, emergency savings for something like that. And they don't have sources uh, to be able to borrow significant amounts, right? So some of the things I was talking about earlier, like buying a home or starting a business, uh, you're not gonna be able to borrow or, or want to borrow that amount even uh, from an alternative financial services provider. And so meanwhile, I'll sort of look at the other side. If you look at MDIs, we know that MDIs uh, serve a higher percentage of minority mortgage borrowers than their non-MDI peers. Uh, they do more to originate business loans. Uh, they are much more engaged with uh, minority populations in the communities uh, in which they serve. So that sort of led us at the Kansas City Fed looking at, at some of those issues and recognizing the ongoing issue about access to credit in minority communities to take a look into the history of black banks in the United States. And uh, as Kaz mentioned in his introduction, I had done a lot of research previously on banking and the financial system in the United States. And as I was doing this work, a lot of it related to uh, Federal Reserve policy issues and government issues and a little bit on the history of the structure of banking in the United States. From time to time, I would come across little uh, stories about black banks in different parts of the country and some of the work they did. And, and it was really some very amazing and powerful stuff and, and some amazing stories. And so I wanted to learn more about that. And we went out and looked around and there were a lot of stories that hadn't been told. And so recognizing uh, what had been going on with the institutions, the importance of issues about access to credit and, and, and wealth accumulation and, and uh, economic opportunity. And the fact that there were some, some really inspirational folks uh, throughout history, we felt it was an important story to tell. And so we published a book and I'll, I'll tell you here in just, uh, in just a bit near the end of my remarks about how you can get, a, get some copies of it for your students or how they can access it if it's something uh, you or they are interested in. But a lot of people, uh, when I go to speak at events, always say, well, I'm well aware of the history of black banking in the United States. I know about the Freedmen's Bank. And so uh, before we talk about getting into the Freedmen's Bank, and I will tell you it was is not a uh, MDI, it was not a black bank. Uh, there was actually talk well before the Civil War about creating a bank for African Americans in the North. Uh, the idea was that it would help to finance business development in the Northern states and, and home ownership and all those types of things, but it would also stand as a very powerful symbolic gesture uh, in the fight against slavery and the fight for equality at, the, at that time. And it's very interesting. Uh, people probably don't think about banks really being at the sort of forefront of major you know, social change, but this was very much the same people who were involved in the Underground Railroad and, and so much in the, in the fight to abolish slavery felt a bank could be very important and powerful. Uh, they didn't advance that idea. Obviously they had a lot of other priorities and, and so a bank took on a lower priority. And so you didn't see it develop. After the uh, the Civil War, the government created what is known as the Freedmen's Bank. And so the idea was, or is really based on the fact that you had a number of African-American uh, soldiers during the Civil War. And so after the war, uh, some of them either died or they lost contact with the government and they'd been paid for their service. And so there was money that was being held in some accounts on their behalf. And so that money became basically the, the foundation of creating the Freedmen's Bank. And this was a bank to serve uh, African-American populations after the abolition of slavery. And so um, even during slavery in the South, uh, slaves in some circumstances had the ability to earn uh, small amounts of income. They could hire out their time in some instances. Some of them would uh, plant gardens and, and sell produce. So they had very small amounts of money. And so the idea was that they could deposit this money in the, in the Freedmen's Bank and it would be uh, safe. 
And so that was the original idea as it was created. And then the Freedmen's Bank would buy government securities and those deposits would earn a very small return. But uh, Freedmen's was not lending money. So it wasn't a bank where uh, people could come in and get loans and do financing and the things I was talking about. Uh, some people have said Freedmen's was really mostly a glorified piggy bank uh, more than anything else. What ends up happening with Freedmen's is uh, the creators, I think, were very noble in their intention. But uh, what ends up happening is it comes under the control of Wall Street interests. And so basically, uh, there's this idea that if we put established Wall Street bankers at the helm of this institution, it will you know, perform better and, and they'll do a better job. And what they end up doing is basically offloading a lot of the bad deals that they have made through their other financial interest into the Freedmen's Bank. And so eventually the Freedmen's, Freedmen's Bank fails and it wipes out uh, the depositors. And so the most any uh, of the savers get, and remember these are people who have literally put their entire life savings uh, in this bank and have been promised uh, to a degree that this is you know, the government's bank and the government will take care of you. It's a, it's a very tragic story. The most anyone uh, gets out of the bank in return is about 60 cents on the dollar. And those who are able to get 60 cents, it, it's a process that goes on for years and years where you have to maintain an address with the government. And, and this process continues on and on. Most people got some more around 25 cents on the dollar. Some of them didn't even try to get their uh, uh, money back because the cost of trying to get the money was actually more uh, than they had in the bank. So it's a very tragic story. And sometimes I get a little uh, frustrated when people talk about the Freedmen's Bank as a minority depository institution because it really, it really wasn't. Um, so from, uh, from this beginning, we see uh, soon in the late 1800s, the creation of the first uh, true minority depository institutions in the United States, the first black banks. So I'm gonna talk about them uh, for a little bit and their experiences and their founders. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the environment today and hopefully set us up for uh, some of the discussion to come this evening. And so these are the first uh, three black banks that were created in the United States. And so I'll talk about them each just a little bit. And again, we'll, I'll talk about, uh, you can get the book and you can go into these stories with a little more uh, depth if, if this is something you're interested in. So the Savings Bank of the Grand Fountain United Order of True Reformers, very, very long name. Uh, the United Order of True Reformers was a black fraternal organization uh, founded by a gentleman named William Washington Brown. And so uh, a fountain is what they refer to as a chapter, a local organization. And then the Grand Fountain is the, is the headquarters chapter. So that's where the name comes from. And so Brown creates this organization and there were other organizations also uh, in the white community at this time. But what the uh, uh, United Order of True Reformers did is it's a fraternal organization that functioned a little bit like a rudimentary insurance provider. And so members would pay in uh, small amounts of dues and then that would be held in a treasury. And then if a member had a death in the family or illness, then there would be a payout to that member or, or to their family or to their, uh, to their heirs, to their survivors. And so these fountains, uh, Brown creates the organization and fountains begin to crop up in different communities, primarily in the South. And so one opens uh, not real far from Richmond uh, where Brown was uh, was based, or the organization was based. And what happens is there has been some, at this time, some increasing uh, racial violence in the area. And so this local fountain had formed and the members uh, started becoming concerned. And there started to be rumors uh, within some of the racist white community that this is a group organizing and they're compiling money. Now remember, uh, Black Americans in the South, especially, during this period and elsewhere also during this period, unfortunately, were not able to ha have access to banks. They didn't have uh, direct access in many cases to a traditional bank. And so this local fountain had been depositing money, uh, well, taking their money actually to a, a white storekeeper and putting it in his safe. And so the white storekeeper started saying this group is organizing. There was a lot of pressure being built on the group. And so the group went back to Brown and they said, uh, we're going to fold this fountain because we're very concerned about our personal safety. We've got this money. We've got nowhere to put it. And so Brown went and met with the group and he had thought earlier in his life about the idea of creating a bank and, and would it be possible. And so uh, this was the opportunity he recognized that if they created a bank, it could hold the deposit from that fountain and all the other fountains uh, located throughout the United States at that time. Uh, 
And then it could also serve the community. So it could serve the organization and then it could also lend to people and, and do all the things that, that a bank does. And so that's the catalyst behind the creation of, of that bank in, in Richmond. Around this same time, uh, Capital Savings Bank was established in Washington, D.C. by a couple uh, gentlemen, Leonard Bailey, who was uh, owned a number of barbershops in the Washington, D.C. area. He was also an inventor, uh, believe it or not, which I just think is crazy. Like, you get to be an inventor. And he invented things that were used by the military and the Postal Service and some government agencies, some uh, mechanical devices they used for sorting and things like that. So he and a gentleman named uh, Milton Holland, who was a Civil War hero, uh, who'd also, I believe, gone to Howard and had a government job maybe in the Treasury. Um, they came together with the idea and basically led the creation of a bank in Washington, D.C. And really their motivation at that time was there was uh, changing political winds in Washington. And there was growing concern, of course, this is after the failure of reconstruction now, and there was increasing concern that the black community were going to start seeing their civil rights uh, begin to erode in the Washington, D.C. area. And so the business community, the black business community came together and said, what, what can we do to sort of act as a protection uh, to, to protect ourselves and protect our community and protect the gains we've, we've been able to make here. And so one of the things they felt was important was the creation of the bank. And so that's the story behind the uh, Capital Savings Bank. And again, very important in the community there. And then finally, uh, the Alabama Penny Savings Bank was created by a gentleman named William Pettiford. And he uh, was in Birmingham. And as Birmingham and, and the continuing growth of industrialization in the United States, and you had a lot of uh, industrial activity going on in Birmingham, the city had a large black population, again, cut off from traditional uh, financial services providers. And so he uh, noticed this and he felt like there was a missed opportunity here, that there was a lot of wealth that could be used to further collectively uh, raise the community up. And so that was really the catalyst behind the creation of, of that bank in 1890. And so he, each of them, you know, obviously very important to their communities as you think about uh, economic development and opportunity. And so uh, each of these banks, they have uh, three things in common that make them very exceptional when compared to other institutions created during that time. So the first one is that they were created with a vision. And we talked a little bit about that, right? They, uh, this wasn't about, make, about making money. No one came and said, hey, we've, we've got some money and, and we can start a bank. Uh, they were particularly innovative and they were also uh, incredibly resilient during, during this period. So again, vision, uh, more than a bank. And, and you can see the quote there from, uh, from Mr. Pettiford. Uh, talking about how really the financial side and making sure that that the institution was making money was really secondary to the bank's uh, to the bank's mission of social improvement and some of the work they were trying to do in the community. Uh, as far as innovation, uh, all three of these banks were very innovative, and you can see. Uh, on the slide here, some of the ways, as far as the way they set up lending programs that were uh, unique for that period, uh, trying to help people access credit and also understanding uh, the needs of their community. And so recognizing that they were working often with small amounts, uh, individuals who would work very long days. So they did things like extended business hours outside that normal, uh, normal sort of banking bankers hours that we think of. Uh, even in that time. They created a lot of special programs uh, related to especially real estate and residential development and trying to get people into homes that were uh, really exceptional uh, for any time, but, but especially uh, for when you think of banking in that sort of late uh, you know, 1880s, 1890s, 1900 period. And then finally, we would say that these banks were um, uh, amazingly resilient. Um, so one thing to understand about banking in the United States during this time is not the way that, you know, today you, you, your paycheck goes to your bank and you probably, hopefully, don't spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, how, how's the bank doing? And so banking in the U.S. around uh, the 1900 is a very different environment in that most banks only last for a few years. So if your bank may last uh, eight years on average, many banks would fail. So it was a very different type of environment. Um, recognize that you didn't have deposit insurance during that period. So, um, you know, there was a lot of pressure on if the, if the bank was uh, losing money or about to go under, you would have bank runs where people would go show up and you'd want to get in line and get your money out. So you were much more concerned about the overall uh, stability of your bank. And, and it was something that could, could be in question. And also 
further complicating all this is that the United States economy in that sort of late 1800s uh, period of more than a decade there, where it's, it's almost one continually unfolding financial crisis. So there's a lot of turmoil. And these banks uh, were resilient. The first, these first three banks had an average lifespan of around 20 years. Uh, you had literally hundreds of bank failures. You had uh, a crazy high unemployment. And these banks continue to function. In fact, the, the bank in Richmond, the local school district at one point, uh, wasn't able to pay its employees and actually uh, went to the, uh, to the local True Reformers Bank and actually got cash from them to be able to pay their own employees when no other bank could help them. So uh, well-run, uh, innovative, incredible leaders and the individuals. I didn't even really talk about their backgrounds and some of the experiences they had in their lives that, that uh, preceded their work in banking. So they're uh, really some amazing, amazing stories. So with that, I know we're gonna be talking a little, little bit about some other issues of, uh, of economic equality. And so one of the questions when I present or when we could go out and, and present certainly with live audiences is sort of what does the future hold uh, right now as we look at uh, black access to financial services, black banks in particular. And so, uh, as I think Kaz mentioned in his opening comments, it's fairly common throughout US history when we have had a period uh, where there's been uh, some type of unrest along racial lines. So in this case, the, the police killing of uh, George Floyd and so many others in recent years, and we moved to an activist period as we saw uh, significantly last year. It's pretty common for there to be something happen in the issue of uh, black access to financial services. So interest in black banking in particular grows during times like this. So obviously you can even go back to the late uh, 1800s and what happened in Washington, right? There was concern about economic opportunity and a rise in activism in Washington that led to the creation of that bank. Uh, you can find it throughout history. You can find it in Detroit in the late, uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. So there's a lot of interest right now in this issue. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, how this unfolds going forward. Uh, there has been um, some significant developments on the idea that online or app, uh, mobile phone app based banking and financial services may provide some, uh, some options to people. Um, I know from my, uh, my, I have a son in high school, I know from his experiences online and some of his classmates, you know, I think when we look for those types of answers, there's definitely some uh, friends of his whose families don't have online access readily available or reliably available to them accessible. Um, so I think that's very, you know, sort of interesting to think about. This has been this idea that, well, if we can, we can bring it to people over computers and technology, but if not everybody has that access, it's kind of tough to see how that's going to develop. Um, we also had recently announced late last year a merger of a couple big banks, one in uh, on the West Coast and one on the East Coast that are going to create what will be the first uh, billion dollar uh, black MDI in the United States. And so that got a lot of attention. Billion dollars is obviously a lot of money, but I will tell you that in the world of banking, uh, that's still a relatively small bank. So you've got to have more than $10 billion in assets to be sort of above, out of that community bank uh, realm that I was talking about at the, at the beginning. So it's still a, a relatively small bank and obviously uh, size of institutions is a very important factor. And, and historically uh, black MDIs in particular have been smaller institutions. They are getting bigger obviously with this deal, uh, but it will be important uh, for them to continue to grow if they're going to be the primary catalysts of driving economic opportunity in, in, in local communities. And so with that, uh, there's a, a, a shot of the, uh, of the cover of the book I was talking about. It's, uh, it's a thin book. I've got one right here. And if it's something you're interested in, you can go to kansascityfed.org and download the PDF. It's accessible for free. Or you can email uh, my counterpart, Christy Bromagem. And that's uh, with an M on the end, not an N. Sometimes people get that wrong. You can see uh, Christy's email there, or you can go to our website and request them. And we will actually send you uh, copies of the book free of charge. So if it's something uh, that you think might be beneficial for your students or your classroom, don't uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. And with that, I think I will uh, uh, stop sharing my computer and we'll welcome, uh, welcome Mary to the event. Hi, Tim. Thanks so much. Thank you for speaking um, on this topic this evening. It's really interesting and informative for all of us. Um, I thought I'd start with uh, a few questions that have come into the chat. So um, you mentioned in your talk there were 142 MDI banks out of, out of approximately how many banks in total? 
So there are what, thousands of uh, bank, what, 4,000, maybe 5,000 banks in the United States right now. And so, you know, one thing I didn't talk about, and sometimes I do, depending on the time for my presentation, is the overall number of community banks in the United States has been on the decline uh, for some time, uh, since about uh, the early 1980s. But the decline in the number of black banks has been more pronounced, uh, not only starting at, uh, from a smaller base, but it's also been dropping at a faster rate too. Okay, thank you. That leads into a second question from our, from our audience. And that is, why are the number of black or African-American banks, uh, the MDI banks going down? Um, so the, the overall, the declining number is based on, you know, sort of everything that you would see happening in the banking industry. So it's acquisitions, uh, sometimes acquisitions uh, by non-minority owners and investors. So we had uh, one of those, I believe, uh, maybe it's in the Carolinas that was acquired by uh, someone. Uh, and there, there's a lot of interest, people getting into banking now for different reasons and looking to try and do things online and, and a lot of things like that. So some banks have gone that way. Uh, some banks like the merger I talked about of two banks, there have also been a lot of failures. So the uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis uh, hit the black community particularly hard, continuing what is a sad tradition in the United States of minority communities getting particularly hard hit by times of crisis. And so while banks are catalysts for the development of economic opportunity, they are also to some degree reflections in their communities. So if their uh, customers are all suffering economically, then the bank is going to suffer economically also, right? That's kind of the, kind of the double rub there. And so that was also very much a factor um, in, in the declining number of these institutions. Thank you. Um, then in your talk, you mentioned that the three banks that you featured were really resilient, far more resilient than other banks at the time. And you touched on a little bit, but could you address uh, your thoughts about why those were more resilient than other banks at the time? I think it, it gets down uh, to why they were in the business. And they were very focused on uh, helping people and helping you know, communities grow. And I think a lot of other people in banking at that time were interested in, in purely making money, right? Or purely mm -hmm. finding a way to make more money. You know, they use their own capital to, to start the thing up or whatever. I, I was reading something the other day that said in 1900, you could start a bank by literally writing bank on a piece of paper and taping it to your front window and, and you were a bank, right? A yeah. very different regulatory environment. And so the people who ran these banks were very focused, had a very focused mission, and they recognized uh, that they were, you know, public trust was essential, and they wanted to help the public. And so they were very thoughtful in what they did, which was very rare for a lot of banks in the United States during that period. Uh, it's also interesting that all three of them, after their original founders uh, passed away or moved on, is when those banks then began to fade. So they had those long runs, but as soon as the, you know, once the visionary or the real person driving that vision was gone is when they uh, ended up having their own downfalls, so. Yeah, I think we, we could bear out that that happens frequently with entrepreneurship though. So yes. we yes. might expect that. Yes. Um, another question from our listeners or our, our viewers is, um, given what you know about MDIs and access to banking, what's the number one thing you would like them to teach their students? The, the number one thing I think is important to teach students is just basic, uh, you know, good finance and good money management, maybe even more than uh, than about these specific banks. I think the stories of, the, of a lot of the people involved in these banks are very inspirational. And everybody who was involved in this project with me, if it's the proofreaders or the designers would come back and say, oh my God, I'm so inspired by, by these people and, and how they live their lives and what they valued and what they did. But I think students really need to, to understand, you know, how to get that it's important to have a, a bank relationship and that it's important that you know you know where you're putting your money and don't borrow on the payday lender and you know if you if you look at um even analysis on like payday lenders and title lenders even in in higher wealth communities uh when they have a large minority population they are more likely to have one of those businesses located nearby so that's not you know that's not just in low-income communities and sometimes people do use 
uh, those firms, even though you would think maybe they didn't have to. Obviously, some people who maybe don't have the wherewithal feel like they have to go to these institutions because they're literally just barely scraping by. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. But even people who have much more financial wherewithal sometimes use these firms and they're really being um, horribly taken advantage of. Yes. And I think these, uh, these individuals who you, who you found so inspiring likely had good financial habits and try to lead those their own customers in that direction as well. Yeah, a lot of those banks would do, you know, that that the idea, you know, the penny savings bank was literally just bring in a penny every day or a penny or a nickel or a dime once a week and grow these accounts. So they did a lot of things too related to like uh, children and trying to get them to, you know, put a put a nickel in the calendar in every week or in this little, you know, thing, little piggy bank. And, and bring it in and we'll create accounts for you. So that was definitely part of their mission as well. Right, so I won't go down that rabbit hole, but we know starting young is important. Yes. Um, so uh, just a couple of things before we move on to the larger panel to, um, to address. And I just wanna confirm that you're, the current number of MDIs is 142. Those are the current number of my own yeah. minority owned banks. So those are all minority owned banks. And okay. so there's what, 20? black banks within that most minority banks fall in that asian pacific islander type okay yeah she so about 20 black owned banks so that that answers the question and then um we had a question here that um even though these, these are minority banks um anyone could open an account right right, right. yeah right okay. and that's you know, and, and we've seen some of that recently. I think Netflix, uh, some other big companies have gone in and, and they have some excess cash and they've put them in to black banks. Uh, the idea is, you know, obviously anybody can have an account at these banks. And sometimes that gets a little bit confused because people will say, well, can't you, you know, you, it's not segregated. You could go to any bank, no matter what race you are. But what we find is that MDIs, uh, as I talked a little bit about in the presentation, are more likely to serve that minority population. And, and we could get into a separate discussion about things like loan uh, denial rates by race and some of those things uh, that can be very eye-opening and, and very troubling. So these are really the banks, especially as you think of that sort of uh, low to moderate income minority community, these are, these are the real sort of backbone of those communities financially. And, just, and then finally, and then I really am going to move to the other panel, to, the, to bringing the whole panel together. Um, evidence, it, it, does your book provide evidence of the impact that those early banks had on their communities? So it's a little difficult going back in that period. So one of the things is uh, a lot of this history, you know, I, I never wanted to say it was lost, but it was definitely uh, fading or very hidden, uh, a lot of this stuff. And so it's not real clear. There's, it's not easy to quantify the difference that it made in terms of, you know, this much in lending or whatever. But you can definitely see um, Richmond from the starting point of that bank goes on uh, and creates, you see the development of an entire uh, major sort of uh, black commercial area along, uh, was it Second Street there? They called it the Deuce in Richmond. And you had multiple banks there, uh, Maggie Walker, uh, the nation's first female bank president. She was also African-American, uh, ran St. Luke's Bank there. You can go, if you're in Richmond, you can go on a tour of her house, which I've had the opportunity to do, which is a national historic site. And so you, you can talk a little bit about how you saw entire communities develop, but, but, but it's not real easy to be able to say, you know, it was this much financial impact. It's just that th those things just don't survive. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, introduce ask our other two panelists to join us. Um, we're being joined this evening by Kristen Brody and Ryan Nunn. Um, they are both economists. Uh, Kristen and Ryan, thank you both for joining us. Um, Kristen, I would ask if you could just take a couple of minutes and introduce yourself. Sure, my name is Kristen Brody. I am the policy director for the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution and Dean of the College of Business at Dillard University on leave. Thank you. And Ryan, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks so much to the organizers of this event for inviting me. I'm Ryan Nunn. I'm Assistant Vice President for Applied Research in Community Development and Engagement at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So again, thank you both for joining us. And Tim, thank you for staying with us. Um, I'm going to broaden the discussion a little bit um, and talk about 
um, the impact of segregation and uh, economic, the results of economic disadvantage. And so I'd like to start with uh, Kristen if, and Kristen and Ryan. So I guess Ryan, we'll start with you. How does occupational segregation contribute to di economic disadvantage? So b before I start, I should say uh, that everything that I'll say tonight will just reflect my own views, uh, not those of anybody else at the Minneapolis Fed or, or in the Federal Reserve System generally. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I think this is, I know that goes goes for all of us, uh, but yeah. this is this is an important question, I think. Um, and it's, it's really a fundamental one when thinking about uh, the labor market. I, I think for a variety of reasons, including labor market discrimination, but also disadvantages that accumulate before the labor market and outside of it. Uh, white workers and workers of color tend to work in very different occupations. By one estimate, you would need more than one fifth of all uh, white workers to switch occupations in order to get to equal proportions. So you know, more than 20% of either white workers or 20% of um, workers of color would have to, uh, to move in order to get us to parity, which to me suggests a, a very economically substantial amount of occupational segregation. Um, I think the clearest indication that this is a problem is that the occupational segregation is associated with very large wage disadvantages for workers of color. But I don't think that's the only reason that this is a problem. Um, I, I know we've seen in 2020, black and Latino workers in particular, disproportionately affected by COVID-19, much of that is a consequence of this occupational segregation. Um, so, you know, we've basically seen by any measure of essential work that frontline um, essential workers are uh, disproportionately black and Latino, and mm -hmm. that this has increased both their uh, economic um, exposure during 2020 and during the pandemic recession, but also the, the physical uh, harm that they're exposed to in the form of the virus. Um, and I, I guess I'd I maybe conclude just by saying that I think there's there's really some strong evidence that occupational segregation and that labor market disparities more generally impose very large costs on the overall economy. Um, by one estimate, economists at the San Francisco Fed find that uh, we lose more than $800 billion in output annually. Uh, from racial labor market disparities specifically. That's not just occupational segregation. Um, it's also the lower returns to work that people of color uh, receive within their occupations. But I think the calculation helps to understand just how large these costs are. Well, thank you. And Kristen, um, would you wanna add something to that discussion? Sure. Um, so my research focuses quite a bit on automation, and um, I find that African American and Hispanic workers are overrepresented in jobs at high risk of being automated, meaning that the job will change drastically or disappear within the next 10 to 20 years. So Black and Hispanic workers account for 13% and 18% of the U.S. labor force but are overrepresented in jobs with a high risk of being eliminated or significantly changed by automation. Black workers are overrepresented in 11 of the 30 jobs that employ the most Americans and are at high risk of being automated. These include jobs like taxi drivers and chauffeurs where they're 29.5%, um, industrial truck and tractor operators, 25.8%, laborers, freight and stockholders, and jobs like that. Um, and so overall, the positions on that list employ 6.4 million Black and Hispanic workers. So a lot of these jobs were e considered essential during the pandemic. So as Ryan said, they were more likely um, to be exposed to, to COVID-19 in jobs that are likely to change drastically or may not exist in the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you. Um, so most of our audience or a great deal of our audience this evening are high school and college educators. And um, you know we have these very, significant topics that, that you've introduced, segregation, uh, risk of uh, automation, uh, uh, replacement by automation. Um, we wanna talk about economic opportunity. We have these things that we want our students to understand. Um, where, 
and as Tim and um, Kaz mentioned, you know, we, we're in a phase of social activism where these things rise to the top. But if we really want to uh, make sure the discussion stays, we have to figure out where to put this in a school curriculum so it lasts, so it stays, so it's... So where do you think these topics would be best addressed in a school curriculum? Is it a current events class? Do we do it in an economics class? Um, what would you say to teachers who are struggling about where to fit these discussions in, in a meaningful way and continue to have this, those discussions semester, 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 regardless of what happens in the um, world around them, these very important topics. Kristen, so, would you? Sure. Yeah, thank you. So I like your idea about the current event class or even um, school forums. And I think one of the important things as we look at jobs that are at high and low risk of being automated, um, a lot of times companies or foundations ask what they can do or how they can help. And one of the things that can be done is partnering with these organizations to have, have a representative give a, a lecture, be it virtually or face-to-face -face, once we can be face-to-face -face again, to talk to high school students particularly about internships or um, entry-level jobs so that they know what to even think about for a college major if they haven't thought about it yet, so that they know what those particular jobs are going to look like, not just I want to be a doctor or a, a lawyer or a police officer, but specifically what the requirements of those jobs are, what one should major in, what skills, be they computer skills or any other kind of skills, so that the teachers know how to prepare students so that students know what to look forward to. And so that when it comes time to hire, there's a pipeline of students that have been prepared to fill those jobs. And, and those partnerships can be created for free. It's, it's just a matter of people volunteering their time to describe what their organizations are looking for. Thank you. I think that uh, idea of community engagement is a good piece to, um, to help teachers keep this top, these topics at the forefront. Ryan, was there anything you wanted to add there? I completely agree. I, I guess I would just step back and say that I think we really need students and, and everyone, but in particular students to have this evidence-based understanding of where racial disparities and barriers to opportunity come from. Um, I think that may be a prerequisite for society to actually make really substantial progress in addressing these disparities. Um, and so I would bring up in connection with this, a, an event series that the Federal Reserve um, has launched just this last October um, called Racism in the Economy. We're running this through 2021. And a big part of the, the goal of that series is to help really get to that shared understanding of um, uh, you know, what underlies racial disparities in a whole range of domains. So we've looked at um, employment, education, and actually housing on this Monday, uh, this Monday afternoon, we'll have that installment. And we're going to look at a, a series of other topics throughout 2021, from uh, racism in the economics profession to entrepreneurship, criminal justice, health, wealth, access to credit, really a wide uh, range of topics where we're going to dig pretty deep into um, the, the specific uh, barriers to, um, to, to reducing racial disparities, but also looking at proposals for uh, policy changes that could help in each case. Um, and, and again, kind of contributing to this broader understanding, uh, not just that the disparities exist, but that they exist because of these um, systemic uh, policies that we really need to, to make more progress against. So, I think that's uh, hopefully a a part of this this effort. Mary, I, Mary can I weigh uh, in so here? Just, Tim, just yeah, I, I want you to weigh in, and I also want I also have a, a follow up question from the audience for you related to this. So okay. yes, please. Uh, and I and I just kind of want to jump in because I'm actually doing a thing with our local civic council here in Kansas City tomorrow about the issue of racial equality, and so we've been involved in some discussions. You know, when I when I think of educators and, and where do you include uh, these types of things, I think you include it everywhere you can. So it's not just a economics discussion, it's history, it's an understanding of the things that Ryan was talking about that um, 
segregation, discrimination, redlining have been hardwired into the geography of Americans' urban centers. And, and it has been reaffirmed and reaffirmed across generations. And changing that isn't going to be a big company throwing a million dollars at a black bank or, you know, the Kansas City Civic Council deciding in the morning that, you know, we're going to get on top of this, right? It's going to take a very long time. And, and just an example that really struck me and, and something I pointed out to my wife, and I think um, as, a, as a white person, you know, I, I think we don't see obviously the segregation of the things, but I will tell you that one of the things that, that really struck me is uh, a couple of years ago, there was a new biography of Frederick Douglass that came out. And so I read a lot of Frederick Douglass, but you know, it's a new biography and it's getting some buzz and maybe it'll tell me something I don't know about it. So I go to the local big box bookstore and I'm in the biographies and I'm looking and I'm looking and I can't find the Frederick Douglass biography. And I'm like, well, that's maybe they sold out of it. It's over in the African-American studies section though. And I don't quite understand why isn't Frederick Douglass's biography and all the other biographies of these great African-Americans, why aren't they all together where, where someone might come across it who wouldn't be exposed to that? And so it's just something that I think about a lot uh, as you think about the world today and the culture. So one of the things I, I, I've said in an earlier part of this series is, you know, we can't have this become something that's only taught in February are only available in the African American uh, area, or African American area studies of the bookstore. Um, it, it has to be, as Ryan, or, and as you mentioned, often and everywhere if we really want to make change. Um, it, and so I think uh, teachers have, we've, these si the series we've been doing uh, with educators has been very well attended for that very reason. And, and our program last week on women in economics, very well attended by high school and college students for that, that very reason. They're looking for ways to incorporate this broadly in the curriculum. So a question that came up for you though, Tim, is, is um, do you feel it's important for teachers to provide the historical context to frame the discussion as to why the black community has a mistrust of banking, which may also contribute to being un underbanked or unbanked. Yeah, and I, I think it's hugely important. And I, and I think it often gets misinterpreted. So a lot of people you will read will say, well, this happened with the Freedmen's Bank. And so African-Americans don't trust banking. The Freedmen's Bank was one domino in a long chain of dominoes coming right up to uh, subprime mortgage lending that took advantage of people. So the idea that, you know, uh, someone's not going to bank because Friedman's Bank 150 years ago, you know, mistreated some people. It was terrible, but that was just one of a lot of events. Um, you know, we, we have to, you know, start thinking more comprehensively about these things and not just, you know, sort of get off the idea. And I, I, I don't, I hope that teachers don't still do this. You know, when I was a student, it was sort of like, well, the Civil War ended and then here's the civil rights era. And it, there wasn't really sort of going in and saying, here's what happened in America. Here's what, you know, really happened. And here's how all these pieces are related. And it's complex and it's messy and it's uncomfortable, but it's got to happen. Thank you. Um, Can I add so, a point to that? Kristen? I just okay. want to add one, one follow-up. This is, this is a, a quote from Charles and Hearst, 2002. They found evidence that Black mortgage applicants were almost twice as likely as comparable white households to be rejected, even when credit history proxies and measures of household wealth were accounted for. So it wasn't even about having you know, bad credit or different credit or, or any of that. And they found that because of that, that that information was communicated to um, the black community and therefore that black people became less likely to apply for mortgages. And so I know that it's 2021, but that wasn't that long ago, right? Like this study is from 2002. So I just wanted to look that up. No, I appreciate and there's, that. And there's it's, another it's not study. that long ago. And there's another study along those lines that I was looking at the other day. It maybe is that same one that it actually showed as income levels rise, the disparity grows. So at very low incomes, the rejections are somewhat similar. As income levels rise, black borrowers become more likely to be turned away than white borrowers as you go up. Um, so the, the disparities are really troubling. 
Thank you. Um, so, Kristen, I wondered if you might uh, talk a little bit about what kind of policy options you think are available or, or might be options for addressing uh, racial wealth disparities and the inequality that we see, such as that you just mentioned. So I think a lot of it, um, there are already policies there. There are already anti-discrimination laws and housing and employment um, and income. So it's like we have these laws. I just think that we need to enforce them. I think the first step is education, that a lot of organizations, be they lending organizations or companies that hire people, they have a, a diversity statement that is outward facing um, but often the people that, that are actually doing the managing may not be familiar with the statement, may not understand what it means, or it's not actionable, right? When, when you do hire a, a diverse party, um, they may be paid less. And, and it's like, what are they supposed to do about that? Like, what is the enforcement for it? Or like, yes, we have these, these laws about equal housing and equal lending, but when that, that particular Black family is rejected, who are they supposed to go to? Who, who's enforcing it? So I think the first step is to, to educate the workers in these organizations to say, this is what our diversity policy is or our inclusion policy or our lending policy is. Um, we are going to enforce it. We do expect you to abide by it. And then carrying forward with that. Um, Maybe we need some new laws, but I think the first step is to enforce the ones that we already have on the books. And that that some of what you said there resonates with me in terms of personal finance on the on the student student teacher side, making sure that students are aware of the rights that they have and where they go to help to get help to enforce those rights. Um, Ryan, did you want to add to the discussion about uh, policy that might work? Sure. So I, I com com again, agree that, you know, anti-discrimination policies need to be better enforced, need to have uh, stronger penalties associated with them in many instances. Um, in addition to that, I would point to um, the importance of some policies that are racially neutral in the way that they are, are written, but that have can have uh, disproportionate impacts. So I'm thinking of intergenerational wealth transfers. Um, you know, the, the, the way our, our tax system is currently set up, inherited wealth is often taxed at a substantially lower rate than wealth that's, or the income that's earned during one's, one's life. And this is something that, you know, matters a lot more. Um, the intergenerational transfer of wealth from white households to, uh, to their children is really large. And so our choices about that kind of tax policy, I think, matter for wealth inequality uh, quite a bit. Um, I would add to that, I think homeownership is really important here. You know, homeownership is a big part of the, the traditional engine of wealth accumulation for, um, well, it, for white families, frankly. And when you look at the, the massive gaps in homeownership rates, which uh, uh, which can't really easily be explained by sort of some of the um, observable differences that Kristen was just talking about in another context. You know, I think it's it's important to look there, especially again in a in a world where the federal government has really subsidized home ownership and made it this um, attractive vehicle for wealth accumulation. So, just just two additional things, and I, there are, there are certainly others, but those are two that I think of. Okay, thank you, well, Kristen. Did you want to add anything? In addition to the, what Ryan had to say there about housing and taxation. I just so happen to have the numbers in front of me that I know Ryan has to it. Since I have him here, I'll, I'll just tell you. Um, according to a report by Zillow, between 1990 and 2018, the homeownership rate between Black and white households increased. Right. So even with everything that's being done, it increased from 27.6 percentage points to 33 to 30.3 30 percentage points. Right, so that gap is increasing. And in the third quarter of 2020, the homeownership rate for white non-Hispanic Americans was 75.8% compared to 61% for Asian Americans, 50.9% for Hispanic Americans, and only 46.4% for African Americans. So it's like we have this gap and, and the gap is increasing even with 
everything that's been done. So obviously there is more work to do in that regard. So that leads to a question that came in from, from the uh, audience and that is, is it um, training in how to uh, implicit, to avoid implicit biases? What, what kind of training uh, do we need to give these folks that are making loans or not making loans um, to make a difference? Kristen, you, you so I, I guess I'll, I'll answer that question because I did one of those trainings for um, an investment and lending company um, just yesterday. So I, I presented to their, their employees and I basically went over all of the determinants of, of the wealth gap, or I shouldn't say all, but a lot of them, the differences in education, income, home ownership, all of those things. But I also talked about um, what those implicit biases look like, um, how, how we think about people based on race, things that, that we say that we may not realize make another person of a different race uncomfortable, um, and, and just things to kind of, things to do and things to avoid as well. So I think if more companies um, had presentations like that, whether from someone internally or someone externally to just start the educational process, I think it's important. Well, thank you. I think that might be valuable training for all of us, not just lenders. Um, so, um, Tim, did you want to add anything to to that discussion or other no, topics? No, I, I was sort of You know, I, well, I was interested to hear what Kristen had to say because I've been talking with some local bankers uh, related to this other initiative I was talking about, and there's been some local surveying here and and bankers on their opinions and prospective borrowers on their opinions. And so I was interested to hear about her experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, Ryan, coming back to um, our topic of economic opportunity and um, how important that is, um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of community activity do you think is necessary um, to really promote economic opportunity for low to moderate income minorities and I think there's so much one could talk about here it's almost hard to to figure out what to focus on um, and mm -hmm. maybe what I would what I would discuss is the the value of uh, subsidized work for uh, for folks with wraparound services in addition to the to the subsidized work for th services like childcare, search help, uh, and so on, with the goal of ultimately getting folks from subsidized work into unsubsidized work. Um, you know, there's there are many programs like this. Um, some have been evaluated more rigorously than others. There's one um, particular program that I'm aware of through the writing of uh, economist David Newmark called uh, New Hope for Families and Children, run into uh, inner city neighborhoods in Milwaukee. And that underwent a uh, high quality evaluation that that found that when you know they subsidized uh, employment for a period of time with these kind of wraparound services that helped to get rid of some of the barriers to work uh, for folks, they uh, were able to, to improve outcomes um, after the, the program ended, were able to transition participants into unsubsidized jobs pretty successfully. Uh, so that that's the sort of thing that I, I think about, but certainly one of many possibilities. And uh, I'd be interested to hear what my fellow panelists think about this. Right. So Kristen, you you mentioned partnerships for schools, but um, in your work, what, what types of um, initiatives are you aware of that help young people um, provide economic opportunity for young people? And you know, what are the characteristics of those programs and what makes them successful? So I'll talk about two programs. One of them is um, provided through the, the UNCF, the United Negro College Fund. They have a career pathways initiative. And so recently they gave $1.2 million to four HBCUs. Each one got $300,000. Dillard University was one of them. And so we created a center for automation and career readiness where we, we do some of what I said, which is to have employers come in and tell us as educators, 
what students should know and be able to do to obtain jobs that exist now and will exist in the future. And also to talk to the students to motivate them. We have individuals come in and talk about what a day in the life of their job is, um, to give a salary range, which often is motivational, um, to share any um, writing tasks or data tasks that they can share that may be a part of their application process so that the students know what's required and so that we know. And if we get that information early, then we may need to change our curriculum, like which, which we do sometimes. Um, we weren't previously preparing them with Tableau or Theta before I, um, I started. Um, and so of course I know that those are things that are necessary. So we bought a Theta license. Um, we're getting an R license. We're teaching them Tableau and other things. But the first step is to find out what do employers want so that we can start to prepare them. And then I think for people who may not be ready for community college or a four-year institution, the Kingsley House is an organization in New Orleans um, that provides job training um, or child care training, child care assistance, um, transportation assistance, and, and just general everyday training for people who may not have a GED, may not be ready for vocational training to try to bridge that gap. Um, so I think those are those are just two sorts of programs that um, that may be helpful on a broader level. Thank you. And the child care, of course, hope assists the person who is attempting to develop job skills and be employed. But we also know from research from the Minneapolis Fed that that high quality child care pays off in many other ways for the child. So it seems to me we get a, a double uh, positive there. Um, Tim, did you want to add anything about initiatives or programs? Um, no, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, we okay. do a lot of stuff through the bank where we work with students uh, of all ages from very young through high school and college students and all kinds of internships. Uh, we do a, we do a lot of uh, a lot of work along those lines. So an, another question that uh, came in from the audience, and that is, um, can you speak to the influence of incarceration in America? on these topics of economic opportunity and, and so forth. And, um, you know, uh, Kristen, I'll let you start if you'd like. And you, you were so, nodding your head, so. I, I, yeah, so I was thinking about it because I have a report um, that, that has the data, but it wasn't one of the things that I had right in front of me. Um, but so there, there has been research on this, lack of it. Of course, African-Americans are overrepresented in the prison population. Um, the numbers have kind of come down for Black women, but not as much for Black men. Um, and I think um, looking at, at the recent law in California, that meant that firefighters, um, people that, that fought fires while they were in prison, could go ahead and become licensed firefighters or EMTs upon um, release if they were nonviolent offenders. Because prior to that, they would have to wait 10 years to even apply. So I think laws like that and changes like that will definitely make a difference. Um, because I think the, according to the data, firefighters um, in California can make up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, that may not be the average, but um, there was data on that. And so, so laws like that, that will allow people to get licenses upon release, um, to get jobs or changing some of the very strict housing and address requirements um, would really make a difference for people who are getting out of prison and trying to, to start over again in the right way. Mary, I think you're on mute. Um, Ryan, are you aware of other research or uh, related to incarceration and opportunity that you might want to share? So I'll enthusiastically co-sign the, the uh, idea of trying to bring our occupational licensing laws in, in better alignment with what we really need for public health and safety, which is often a lot less than, uh, th than what's put into law currently. Um, I guess one other thing that I think sometimes doesn't get enough discussion is the role of monetary sanctions in, uh, in thinking about this. So people who have been incarcerated or, or just had any interaction with the criminal justice system are often uh, experiencing these these really unsustainable um, uh, monetary sanctions, so fines, fees, 
that follow them after that interaction. And that can make it difficult to uh, to work, to kind of re-enter uh, the labor market and to forge a, um, you know, a, a prosperous life outside of the criminal justice system. And I think that's that's something we need to really wrestle with, figuring out how to make those those monetary sanctions more proportionate to people's means. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll stay with you, Ryan, and I know there's been a lot of research about this, but I'd like a, to hear a discussion about the disparate impact of COVID on people of color and how long you think it'll take these communities to recover from the impact and what policies might best affect the, the recovery for these communities. So I'll just say, I think actually Kristen has the better understanding of this, having okay, done some recent work fine. on it. That's fine. But I, but maybe you I, know, I, I, I just, I know there's been research in, at the banks as well. Kristen, I, I apologize if I, uh, I... I'm happy to just tee it up, though, by saying that I, you know, the unemployment rate spikes for workers of color have been really sh striking through, through April 2020 and then persistent after that. And there's just, there's no question there's been a disparate impact but I'm curious what Kristen has to say. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Ryan. Kristen, please. It's like we're working together because while you were saying that, it really was a tee up because I was finding um, the data You're that I wanted to share. Um, so as of February 4th, um, 2021, one in 645 Black Americans had died um, or 155.2 deaths per, per, per 100,000. And that's compared to one in 825 White Americans were 120.9 deaths per 100,000. And African-Americans, of course, were already a much less, a much lower percentage of the population. And as far as the unemployment numbers, um, I have them. Okay, so um, I, I'm gonna start with at the beginning of the, the pandemic. So at the beginning in March, 2020, the US unemployment rate was 4.4%, but the unemployment rate for black workers was 6.7% compared to 4% for white workers. Now, by August, 2020, the unemployment rate for black workers had increased to 13%, almost twice the rate of white workers, which was 7.3%. Um, and so as businesses began to reopen and restrictions were loosened, people started to go back to work, the unemployment rate started to decrease falling to 6.7% in November, 2020. But the un unemployment rate for Black workers was 10.3% still, and that was 4.4 percentage points higher than the rate for white workers, which was 5.9%. Now, by January 2021, um, there was still this disparity, right? So the, the unemployment rate overall was 6.3%, but was 9.2% for Black workers compared to 57 for white workers. So that kind of gives you a, a picture of unemployment during um, the pandemic. And um, I guess the, the only other thing I would add to that, just for historical reference, is if you look at unemployment from 1969 to 2019, the African-American unemployment rate is the highest the whole time. Like through recessions and, and times of, of economic um, growth, the highest the whole time. And so, what what policies, you know, not just to affect recovery from COVID, but we need policies that are going to change that that data. And it, it's related to a question that just came through, which is um, a, a person saying they're very concerned about the future of work for adolescent Black girls. And is there data related to that? So, you know, what can we do to change this and and then perhaps what you know about uh, work and adolescent black girls. Go ahead, Ryan. Well, I, I guess I would say to the first part of the question, Mary, that I think we actually have done a somewhat better job in some respects during this recession at trying to provide some of the safety net support that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that would help here. So this isn't getting at the root causes. This is not getting at the persistent disparities um, by race in unemployment rates. But through the unemployment insurance system, you know, we had more, uh, we brought more people into that system and we provided more generous benefits. And so I think 
you know, one thing we can we can do at least as an acknowledgement of this reality is just to make sure that we have these robust uh, safety net policies in place and in particular unemployment insurance. Thank you. Kristen, did you want to add to that? So I'm, I'm glad Ryan said that. Um, I think I'll, I'll talk about the, the part about for adolescent black girls. I think yes. that, that, that having more role models, which I guess we're definitely seeing one of the things that, that I think about is seeing black faces on the news. When I watch CNN and MSNBC, do I see people that look like me? Do I see people that are talking about issues that include me? And I think with Joy Reid now having um, a, a show on primetime on MSNBC or Abby Phillip um, having a show on CNN or seeing Jason Johnson and, and Tiffany Cross. I think seeing role models like that really, really makes a difference. Um, and, and not just in terms of entertainment, right, but with the people that deliver our news in addition to having Black teachers and seeing Black women that look like them coming in to talk to their classes again, be, be it virtually or face-to-face -face, just so that they see um, people that look like them in many different walks of life and in many different types of employment so that they know that they can do that too. So that ties back to, again, your connection with community partners and, and schools and having these folks come in to speak to students, but also even just having them see video of pictures of people that you might talk about in the classroom who look like them, who have these careers um, would be valuable as well. Um, we have another question here about um, the school to prison pipeline and the effects of economic opportunity for communities of color. So how do you think the school to prison pipeline affects the economic opportunity for uh, communities of color? I think we touched on it, but I, if you have anything to add relative to that, Brian or, or Kristen. I know it's, 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 it's tough right. sometimes. So I think, um, and I can't tell you exactly what the study is, but there's, there's a study that looks at, I think third grade and then fifth grade um, reading scores or, or mm -hmm. you know, performance in school and they can gauge um, the increase or decrease in the prison population based on that. Um, furthermore, the book Push Out talks about um, young Black women being pushed out because they get suspended because they, they have an attitude problem or they're angry or whatever it is, but without looking at why, without looking at do they have food to eat at home, are they being abused, um, are their parents there? How do they get to school? All of those things that may lead a child of any race to be angry or to appear angry or defensive. And so instead of just um, penalizing the child, look at why and try to figure out what can be done so that they're not hungry or tired or, or you know, unable to get to school, right? It may not be a matter of anger. If you, if you can fix some of those things, then they're more likely to be alert and awake and, and warm and able to study and, and focus in school, right? So I think you have to look at the background closet mm -hmm. um, and not criminalize um, young people or, or anybody unfairly. So that comes back to um, something Ryan said earlier, but not, not in relationship to schools, but wraparound services for students in school so that we're addressing the problem and not the symptom um, and trying to keep them on track. And, and you're right, you're right that the study is that, you know, if you're on grade level at third grade, you're more likely to graduate from high school. And if you're more likely to graduate from high school, a lot of other things fall into place. So um, we have another question and I, I think I'll, I'll uh, take this to, um, uh, to Ryan, since it's related to Jerome Powell, I'll start with you. Uh, Jerome Powell just said the unemployment rate is closer to 10% than the official rate of 6.7% due to fear of COVID-19. Um, so if that disparity exists, what's the disparity in terms of black and white rates there? So I, I guess I would say 
there are a number of measures you can use to understand the labor market distress that folks are experiencing. Um, you know, there's no, I, I don't think there's any one measure that is ideal. I think in, I've really looked at a wider variety of them over the course of 2020 because uh, there've been these real challenges for, um, for both for data collection and kind of for the traditional understanding of what those signals mean. So I'm giving, I'm gonna give a bit of a wonky answer, I think, because it's been such a strange time. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there were, uh, there were a lot of folks who were um, essentially temporarily unemployed. You know, they were they were not working, but they were expecting to come back to their employer. And so it was difficult for the statistical agencies to really apportion those people to unemployment or to out of the labor force. And so there have been there's been that kind of difficulty. I think that's diminished over time as the number of temporary unemployed has has fallen. But I guess sort of stepping back a minute, what I would do is is look at a few things. I'd look at the standard unemployment rate. I'd look at um, the the sort of so-called special unemployment rates that include folks who are marginally attached, um, part-time for economic reasons and so on. I'd look at things like the prime age uh, labor force participation rate, just the whole the whole basket of, of measures. But I think what they're all telling us right now is that there's still a great deal of labor market distress. Uh, the labor force participation rate uh, for mothers of young children in particular, something we've looked at in our work, we find it fell dramatically in the early months of the pandemic and it really hasn't recovered um, like the labor force participation rates of other other groups. So there, there are there are many measures really giving us this, um, this picture of, of persistent distress and certainly as we've already discussed that distress is worse for workers of color um, and that's you know something that we can't lose sight of as we look at aggregate national overall rates of any of these measures. We really need wherever possible to be looking um, separately by race and ethnicity. So disaggregating data is really important for us. Um, could you just t touch on just a moment what you mean by marginally attached just to clarify for everyone? Sure, I'm gonna uh, flub the exact census definition of it, um, but I'm I'm really I mean I'm thinking broadly of people who, you know, have worked at some time in previous number of months, um, but may not be actively searching for work right now. So to be unemployed by the the traditional standard, you need to be ready to work, uh, actively searching for work, and able to take mm -hmm. a job. Uh, but there are folks who, you know, could could pretty easily transition into employment, um, but may not satisfy those precise criteria. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, we've talked a little bit about careers and having students see people who look like them. Uh, and we talked about lawyers and doctors, police officers, firemen. Um, there's a comment here about um, uh, having black youth have role models who work in the trades. Um, and I wondered if you might talk a little bit about that. I think we sometimes get focused on, um, perhaps get focused on, it's gotta be college. It's gotta be a four-year college. Um, so Kristen, would you wanna comment on, on that, your thoughts? So I was, I was looking for this data point as you were asking the question. Um, so I'm gonna list a couple of jobs that are at low risk of being automated, but um, may not require a college degree. So one of them is um, first line supervisors of office and administrative support workers. That that's a job where you, you could work your way up to it possibly without having um, a college degree. And that particular job has an automation risk score of 0 0.014 on a scale of zero to one, one being that it could be 100% done by a computer, zero meaning that it, it can't be done at all. And so as I'm looking, um, so lodging managers as well, um, like managers of hotels, very low risk of automation, may not necessarily require a college degree. Um, people who supervise mechanics or run um, car, uh, like mechanic shops, jobs like that, um, installers, repairers, plumbers, these are various jobs in the trade um, that have low risk of automation, 
Um, so they will exist for quite some time, but that you don't necessarily have to have a college degree for and um, are likely to pay above um, above the, the average wage, basically. Thank you. And I, I would mention that programs like Launch Code here in St. Louis, and I think in other parts of the country where people can get training in writing code and computer programming, web development, without the training comes without a four year degree. It comes, um, but it prepares them readily for employment. So I would just add that. Ryan, did you want to add anything as we wrap up? I'm going to turn it back over to Kaz in a minute here. No, just thank you for an interesting discussion. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Tim? Anything oh, bad or I thought no. I thought it was. I thought it was a good discussion. I was happy to be a part of it. And I hope everybody who's uh, uh, tuned in uh, tonight. Yeah, I really want want to thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for um, being with us this evening and engaging in this discussion. Um, we're getting positive comments in the chat about uh, the discussion. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Cass Finley. Thanks so much, Mary. In closing, I'd like to extend our thanks to tonight's keynote speaker and panelists for sharing their expertise and insight on this relevant and timely topic. Kudos. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Mary, for moderating, moderating and guiding our discussion. Although the current school year has been different from any other, we hope you've received information and tools tonight that will be of value. We, rec we recognize that many aspects of your curriculum, instruction, and student interaction has been experimental and flexible with the changing climate, not to mention your kids being at home with you as your work. However, we are optimistic that this discussion, when shared with students and continued in your classrooms, will spark more inclusive ideas and practices. Even though the teaching and learning environments may be hard to define, whether in person, virtual or hybrid, illustrations heard tonight can help move towards real and sustainable change in the racial economic divide. Armed with these examples, each of us can strive to cultivate more diverse and inclusive environments for our students, schools, and communities. We'll continue with the fourth and final webinar in discussing race and inequality in the classroom series on Wednesday, June 30th at noon Eastern. The focus will be COVID's impact on economic well being with keynote presentation by Jeff Larimore, Chief of the Consumer and Community Development Research Section at the Federal Reserve Board who will share updates from the survey of household economics and decision-making. The event will be open to educators and high school and college and level students. Also, another event for educators in the audience to consider attending eConnections with the Fed on Thursday, April 22nd at 4.30 PM. Connect with Federal Reserve Economic Education Specialists to hear about content and materials for enhancing classroom instruction and personal finance and economics. Registration details for both of these programs will soon be available on federalreserveeducation.org. Also on this website, you will find free curricular resources produced throughout the Fed system as well as recording of tonight's program. You can also find local Fed access to your district's materials and contacts you can reach out to for questions and assistance. Thank you again for joining us this evening, discussion on race and economics. We look forward to seeing you June 30th. Have a great rest of your school year and good night.